This hour brought to you by GCNLife.com. Live younger, look younger, feel younger at GCNLife.com. Hello, this is James Bond, the Godfather of Soul. I feel good. You check it out, my man, Mike Siegel. Hit it, buddy, hit it, buddy, hit it, buddy. Welcome in. Good to be back. Nice to have you with us for another big program, and we are delighted to be here as always. The Julian Assange story continues. There no doubt will be some reference to that in Bob Mueller's release of the Mueller report, or at least the Attorney General's release of the Mueller report. And... uh, there's an underlying question. Is Julian Assange a traitor, a treasonous criminal, or is he a hero? He's in, it's interesting about his prosecution because it wasn't for what we thought it would be. It wasn't for publication. It was actually for some sort of conspiracy with Chelsea Manning, formerly Bradley Manning, to uh, put together a way of uh, breaking into the websites of adversaries. And so that's a much lesser crime and much tougher to prove. Assange's argument is simply that Hey, I'm just a journalist publishing. I did what Daniel Ellsberg did, what the Washington Post did. Ellsberg gave the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post. They published them, and that was that. So, as the Supreme Court said, the Post isn't liable. All they did was publish it. Yeah, it was stolen, but they just published what was stolen. They didn't steal it. Same thing that Assange is arguing, and that's why they're not going to charge him with that crime, because the Supreme Court's already decided it. We are joined by a gentleman who's going to give us some background about the Julian Assange case, Craig Wynn, who became one of the first dot-com billionaires when his company Value America went public at the same time Jeff Bezos was simply selling books. And uh, he actually wound up very quickly retiring to do other things we'll talk about, perhaps. But, Mr. Wynn, it's good to have you with us. How are you? Oh, good, Craig. Hi, Mike. Uh, yeah, this whole story is um, is interesting. It depends on your frame of reference as to well, whether or not uh, Julian Assange is a, um, a hero, or really someone to be respected and celebrated, or if he is a dangerous, uh, he can't be a traitor because he's not an American, but uh, a man who somehow made America more vulnerable. Uh, personally, I'm on the side of he's a, uh, he's a hero. Um, his, uh, the actual indictment against him is that he helped, uh, well, I guess he's now as Chelsea Manning, uh, he, he, he changed her, his name, uh, um, with a password to get into another um, a subsequent government computer because Manning had provided um, WikiLeaks with some really damaging, um, and I, I don't mean damaging in terms of security, damaging in terms of credibility and character, uh, information on um, on the way the war was being uh, waged in, in Iraq. And that's why uh, Manning, as a uh, intel officer, decided to share this as is that um, he learned something I did in my research, which is the um, U.S. Department of Defense, their go-to mode on most everything is to deceive, to lie. It's it's not their secondary choice. They, they just think it's somehow appropriate to mislead us, uh, the, uh, the American citizens in the world, about almost everything they've done. And, and, uh, and so this began with uh, Manning providing the um, uh, helicopter videotape of a 
um, Apache attack helicopter with that uh, 50 caliber uh, Gatling gun in the front uh, gunning down, I think it was uh, 14 civilians, um, two uh, Reuters journalists, and a number of women and children. Um, and the, the commentary, the, the conversation between the pilots and the, those that had dispatched them, all looking at the same video, is was just so reprehensible. And um, and America, of course, had denied it, and and it was was a lie. It, we did exactly what what was claimed, and that's how this all began. And um, and so once Manning had uh, a about a, a conviction that says, you know, these are are lies that ought not stay that way. Um, he got access to enormous uh, amounts of uh, of international cables between various um, departments within the United States, particularly State Department, Department of Defense, and and the thing that made them so uh, damaging not to security but to credibility is that American behavior around the world was was reprehensible. We we did a lot of really rotten things. As a matter of fact, one of those cables actually has America. Um, maneuvering to start the war that we're now dealing with in Syria. So there's a lot of a lot of things in them that that just oh, were embarrassing to the country, which is why they're going after him. Well, it, it, the the some of the what you what you said has to do in Syria, I think, with Hillary Clinton and the um, whole issue at Benghazi, um, because that area was being used they say, for transport of weaponry to other areas. And it was, um, it's a, there's a lot more to it than what the surface seems to be. So Yeah, the, the whole Benghazi thing was, was just, it's been so poorly reported. Um, and listen, I, when it comes to Hillary Clinton and, and uh, in Syria, I, there is, there's nothing good to be said. I, I mean, I... I am apolitical, so I'm, I'm not going to hawk for the right or for the uh, the left. Uh, I know uh, many on both sides and have been close to presidents, and uh, I've, I've never found anyone that I would say I respect that's held that's respected that's held that office. But um, you know, the Benghazi thing was that the um, CIA, uh, working out of the U.S. Um, embassy and uh, um, and other government facilities within Libya had come to the conclusion that they could befriend an Islamic terrorist group. And they had these guys over to play basketball and to dinner and, and all manner of, uh, of opportunities where they rubbed shoulders with them. And, you know, they were you know, seeing if they could, could uh, partner with scorpions to, uh, to find out intel on other scorpions. And uh, uh, Ansar Islam uh, turned out to be an Islamic terrorist group, and they they uh, used what they knew about the American um, I, embassy and other facilities there uh, to gain access. Uh, and so they were immediately recognized for who they were. And and the, the sad thing is what um, uh, both Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton did in the aftermath of it, where they were unwilling to acknowledge that this was... Uh, Islamic terrorism, and that, uh, and that we knew it was an Islamic terrorist attack the moment it occurred, and we knew who it was that committed the attack because the people in the uh, in Benghazi had spent a lot of time with them. And so well, you know, I was going to say that a whole uh, series of lies. Well, it was, and it was done for political reasons. Bob Gates, we're getting off the point a little bit, but this, that's fine. Bob Gates, uh, the Secretary of Defense under several presidents. Mm-hmm. wrote in his uh, memoir that he was in the, in the uh, office with Hillary and Obama mm-hmm. uh, and and they were talking about what to what to politically do they didn't want anybody to think there was still terrorism as a threat when Benghazi happened so they tried to suppress it and they didn't want to send any troops they didn't want they didn't send anybody no. um, and he had asked about 600 times had the ambassador the, for uh, for support over that summer, never got it. The American Red Cross had pulled out. 
Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Back we are. Good to have you with us. Mike Siegel and Craig Wynn is with us. And he's here as uh, founder of Value America. Very briefly, tell us about Value America, how you started oh, it, the, co- the kind of company it was. Yeah, it was my, uh, I think the third company I took uh, public, but it was a an, an internet retail company that, that actually did uh, a much better job of what Amazon does today, long before Amazon uh, did it. And just marvelous product presentations, great uh, relationships with manufacturers, and we created this this affinity way of uh, of shopping, so that the the store was literally created on the fly around each individual customer. So that if you if you had an affinity for your favorite, you know, your university sports team uh, or charity, uh, the uh, the whole store was designed uh, specifically with um, that look and feel, and made donations to uh, your your favorite cause. So it was in a full range of products, and we were the first just to literally carry everything you can imagine in terms of uh, product categories. But was now, were you, were you on um, on the Internet, or, would the, or yeah, so did you have stores? Based, yeah, it was an Internet-based um, okay. retailer. I came up with an idea. Uh, having grown up in the retail space uh, and as a supplier to retailer, uh, you're probably familiar with Costco. And, of, uh, of course. And, uh, the like, uh, the, the, and Walmart, well, the... the, the predecessor for both of those uh, were uh, uh, inventions of a fellow named Saul Price. He created Price Club, which became Costco, and he created Fedmart, which uh, uh, Sam Walton copied to create uh, uh, Walmart. And uh, he was a good friend and, and um, kind of mentor of mine, and, and so he was the, probably the most inventive man in, in uh, modern American retail history. Um, and having worked for him, I, I was able to apply a lot of, of retail strategies to the Internet space. And, and uh, unfortunately, those that valued the Internet uh, in terms of public companies had no concept of, real, of, uh, of, um, of what it is to, to retail products. Um, and so their metrics were, were pretty crazy. So it was a really bizarre world where you were... Uh, evaluated on criterion that made no sense, causing people to do things that made no sense. But um, nonetheless, it was an interesting experience. experience. Let's go to um, this this whole question. We we got into a little bit about that uh, Benghazi situation, uh, which has a lot more to it than we know. Maybe yeah. more will come out. But uh, the real issue here today uh, with Assange is uh, at, at the center of it is the rightness or wrongness, as you said, of, do, of doing what he did. Would you agree that the Supreme Court decision in the Ellsberg case, Washington Post case, really applies to this case, that he was simply, even if yeah. it were stolen material, he was simply publishing it the same way the Washington Post published uh, the Pentagon Papers? Yes, but that's why the U.S. did not indict him on uh, on the publishing of uh, of what he found, because the publishing uh, did the, the nation greater good you know if you if you're interested in whether or not your nation is behaving in an appropriate way uh, the service that he provided is uh, is well is even greater I think than uh, Edward Snowden I mean Edward Snowden basically said your your country is violating the Constitution and is spying on its own citizens uh, you know that's extraordinarily valuable information to uh, to know particularly in a in a uh, representative uh, government. Um, so the U.S. government is, is not indicting him on the publishing of the information, but instead on the way that he got the information. And the second round of cables, it is alleged that that um, WikiLeaks assisted Manning in uh, breaking into the computer uh, that uh, had the um, international cables between the Defense Department and the uh, State Department. With um, <laughs> with him having done that, <laughs> excuse me, there was going to be obviously a political reaction. Correct. Uh, first, the president said, uh, "Bring it on, WikiLeaks." During the campaign, then he oh, he loved WikiLeaks. He, he just he, 
fact, he even said, I love WikiLeaks. Right, and then he said recently that he didn't really know much about them. I guess he, he said, I, I guess he knew, he knew what he read in the paper about them, I guess. But um, yeah. then that was that. But, um, I mean, Julian Assange sees himself as as an heroic figure, yeah. uh, as as somebody. He should. As, as, and, and tell us why. Uh, the same reason that Edward Snowden should see himself as a heroic figure. And any time that somebody has the courage uh, and the wherewithal to expose malfeasance of the degree that the U.S. government has been engaged in, uh, and provides people with information where they are now empowered to make intelligent decisions. Um, that kind of an individual is, is rare, and and they and they do so at, at great personal sacrifice. So, I mean, there's nothing. It's just like the uh, the uh, Clinton emails that uh, WikiLeaks released, uh, knowing what was actually being said when the microphones weren't turned on and the cameras weren't turned on, uh, was very helpful for the American people to make a decision as to who they were going to vote for. And to claim that that WikiLeaks was somehow responsible for destroying the candidacy of Hillary Clinton is nonsense, because all they did was release what she wrote. Well, you know, I, uh, you write stuff that's that's stupid and embarrassing. You ought not complain that yeah. that people are reading it. I, I no, I agree with you. But the the the, the, the two sides of that are going to be this: uh, WikiLeaks is going to say exactly what you said. Listen, mm-hmm. you Hillary or mm-hmm. John Podesta or whoever wrote this stupid stuff. Right. Uh, and if you want to write that and make yourself vulnerable to it being released, that's your problem. The right. other side of the coin would be that they would ex- that they would expect that it would be secure, that it would be private, and that somebody would not come in and hack or steal it. So, uh, in other words, because we say things in private, I'm sure you have, I'm sure I have, I'm sure everybody has. Um, look, sometimes you might say to yourself, I'd like to kill that. My mother used to say that to me. I'd like to kill you. You're, you're, a, you're a public figure because of your program. If you are writing to people as part of your job as, uh, uh, as a host of a talk show, then what you write, what you say, uh, uh, is fair game for people to know. What you say to, to uh, in your family and your private life is not. Right. And so if you're going to run for public office like the presidency of the United States, what you say in your emails, uh, you don't have a right to privacy then. I mean, you really don't. You have a right to privacy if you're talking to your daughter but not uh, when you're talking to colleagues in your party uh, about what strategy you're going to deploy if you're running for public office. You no, I, if I hear you. And, and absolutely. We're going to get to a break here, but I'll just say this, that uh, and maybe we can cover this on the other side. She destroyed 33,000 emails that had been subpoenaed. They destroyed uh, laptops and iPhones and yes. iPads with, right. with the material on them. She bleach bit a server. Um, if that's if you want to talk about obstruction of justice, I mean that was the epitome of it. So Correct. we'll come back and get into what's going on now. Um, as somebody who's been very successful in America, I'm sure you love this country, and I'm sure you may have some thoughts about what's happening with the Department of Justice at the top, with the FBI at the top, with James Comey, Andrew McCabe, uh, Weissman, uh, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, all of those. We'll come back on that and much more. Mike Siegel in with Craig Wynn. Stay with us. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Now we're back in. Good to have you with us. Mike Siegel here as we get back with our guest Craig Wynn, who is a very successful American businessman, live the American dream. And... Um, uh, before we get to what I was su- going to suggest earlier, let me ask you about some of these guys on the left, like George Soros, Soros and Tom Steyer, uh, a couple of other billionaires who seem to think uh, that they want left-wing radicalism, basically socialism, controlled by the government of the economy. Uh, and you see the Democrat Party is no longer the party of Hubert Humphrey, whom I'm sure you remember, no longer the party of... Lyndon Johnson, for that matter, or Harry Truman, um, 
they're way out there. What do you what do you make of where the Democrat Party has gone? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the most famous speeches ever, JFK's uh, speech, and I ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, you know, is the antithesis of the socialistic mindset of the Democratic Party today. Matter of fact, JFK's speech would be more conservative today than most Republicans would uh, would even speak. So the whole nation has moved hard left. And in fact, it's interesting that uh, that China, which we think of as a, as a communist country, and it is communist from its government point of view, but that they uh, have embraced free enterprise economically. And so that's the fastest growing economy in the world. And the United States has moved fairly hard left to a more socialistic uh, economy. And our economy has suffered as a result. And, you know, I, I listen to the rhetoric of uh, those like uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, and you, you wonder how a man who admits that he's a socialist, and I would say he's a communist, um, garners such a following among young and educated voters. And it's astounding that they can't figure out that communism has just reduced everyone to the lowest common denominator and deprived people of their freedoms uh, while impoverishing them every place that it's ever been tried. And, and usually when it's imposed, huge uh, parts of the population are, are massacred, uh, are, are starved to death, so it's, are imprisoned. It's, uh, uh, no, I, I'm just absolutely stunned that we have created this entitlement mentality in America uh, where um, particularly the Democrats have gone hard left and the Republicans have become uh, sort of in the middle. What, what, how can you explain, if you can, I mentioned Steyer and Soros and others like them on the left who are wealthy. How can you explain that when it had to be a free society, a free economy, capitalism, that allowed them to do what they did? And yet they want to turn around and, and take control away for others to do the same thing. You know, I think a lot of that uh, falls into the idea of control versus uh, money. Uh, there's this confusion that uh, fascism is far right and that communism is uh, far left. And this actually falls right into that same confusion because that's really not true. Both both are capitalistic systems. There are three capitalistic systems, uh, fascism, socialism, and free enterprise. They all use capital, both the labor and uh, and monetary capital. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the production of goods and services, and the only difference is control. Who controls things? Uh, and in uh, both the fascist and the socialist system, everything is controlled top down. But it is possible to own that which is being controlled in the fascist system. But truthfully, that which is controlled, uh, the person controlling it has more authority over it than the one that owns it. And so a lot of times these people become extraordinarily rich and they seek the only thing that uh, their money can't give them directly, which is power. Yeah, and I, so they that's... become political to uh, to gain power and influence. And I think that's what the Soros has done. I think that's what the Kennedys did um, is they tried to transition uh, from money, which did not bring them the satisfaction they thought it would to power and influence. Uh, that's a very astute point, and I've, I've often thought that, because it's now about power for these guys. It's no yes, longer about the money. Correct. I mean, the the, the money is uh, almost meaningless at, at that point. Right. Um, and, and now it's about having an agenda. But, uh, but I, when you talk about the young people, I think that's scary. Um, Correct. I, I, and the reason I think it's scary is because I think, look, when you or I were younger, there was a certain kind of work ethic. Correct. I don't think that exists anymore. No, I think it doesn't. A lot of young people have made it in in the in the IT industry and in, in right. uh, social media, computers, all of that, which is a which is a fairly easy way to get it done in a society. I mean, look at Facebook. Zuckerberg, to me, is the most unimpressive guy I've ever seen testifying before Congress. Yeah, right. He, he's right he's, he's he absolutely has. 
no, no strength. All right, and, and of course, Facebook, which is enormously popular, is really a dangerous site because it it causes people to participate in a very artificial realm, uh, and it's it is the place where so many of the conspiratorial myths that are just so damaging to one's credibility and ability to think uh, are promoted, and where people are just enamored with with videos as opposed to actually reading to uh, garner the evidence that's required to execute good judgment. And then you, you, you blend that with uh, what's happened educationally, where political correctness uh, just dominates the indoctrination of students, where it's, it's not what's right or wrong, it's what's politically correct. And what's politically correct is, is almost always wrong. And essentially, we've just made a country where uh, it's a crime to exer- exercise good judgment. So well, we you have know, a whole generation that can't think. I, I can't, but they want to. Well, the reason it's scary is because these kids think it's a free ride. I, I, I mean, I've seen. They should have free medical care, free education, uh, free housing. And they say, I deserve free tuition. You know, look, you know yourself. I, I, let me give you an example of something. Yeah. I, I got divorced many years ago, mm-hmm. uh, my first marriage, and um, I had a friend who happened to be a minister. Uh, I'm Jewish. He was Christian, and that's great. And um, he said he, he was. I want him to do some counseling for me uh, as the relationship ended. And he he said, "Look, I'm going to charge you ten bucks an hour per session because if I if I don't charge you, you're not going to take what I say seriously." <laughs> and it's kind of like when you get the free newspaper in the newspaper yeah. box on the I corner. Agree with you. You may read it, you may not, but if you pay a buck for the New York Times, you better believe you're going to read it. If you're paid not to work, you're, you're, you're going to lose that drive, the sense of character, the sense of worth, the um, uh, sense of self-reliance that is so essential to well, isn't, isn't the left and, and being a, a net contributor to society. And isn't the left in that case, when we talk about dumbing down America, isn't yeah. there the attempt to mediocritize everybody? Yes. Well, you know, one of the things that we did... Could your company have made it today, do you think? Rhetoric, ...debate, all, all the, the tools that you need to exercise good judgment, to um, to be able to think rationally. Um, that's uh, not what's taught anymore. It's uh, it's extraordinarily sad what's happened to, to the American uh, indoctrination system as opposed to education system. Do you believe your company, would, have, if you started it today, would you have been as successful as you were? Not a prayer. And the reason... Is that it? And the reason I didn't start another business after it is that through the three businesses that I took public, the first business, about 90% of the people I hired were honorable. You could trust them. If your back was turned, they were going to still do the right thing. And then in the second business, it was about 50 50. And the third business, it was about 80 20 the other way, where 80% of the people had no sense of values or right or wrong or ethics. And uh, felt entitled, and and would stab you in the back even while they're taking a uh, a salary from you. And so I, I just lost my sense of uh, of trust in the people that you could hire because I found that so few of them were trustworthy. We'll come right back. Sad note, sad commentary, but unfortunately the way <laughs> the way it is. We'll come right back, and we're going to pick it up with uh, whether this country has gone through an attempted coup of a sitting president and what that means for all of us. Stay with us. Much more coming right after the break. Back we are. Good to be in. Mike Siegel here. Our guest is Craig Wynn, a very successful businessman, founder of Value America, two other companies that went public, uh, and is a concerned American citizen. So let me lay out a scenario for you, uh, Mr. Wynn, if we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got a situation where, during the campaign, Hillary Clinton and the Democrat National Committee, mm-hmm. both, and she, she, she was controlling the money, as you said, control earlier. Hillary controlled the money of her campaign, obviously, and of the DNC. Mm-hmm. Money from both went to Perkins Coie, a very prominent law firm. Right. Uh, from Perkins Coie, it went to Fusion GPS, yes. which, which they paid to get dirt. On Donald Trump, Fusion GPS is a slimy company uh, that goes out and gets dirt on people, good or bad, or credible or not credible. 
-hmm. So they then hire Christopher Steele. Christopher Steele had been with MI6, the British intelligence agency, yes. at the Russian desk and uh, knew Russians. So uh, Fusion GPS gets some money to Christopher Steele. Mm -hmm. He then takes money and pays Russians to give him dirt. And uh, under oath at a deposition in London, Christopher Steele said, I can't verify any of this. There's a 50-50 chance it might be true. Uh, even And then that was used, that yep. dossier, yep. 35 pages, as you know, was used right. by the uh, Justice Department, yep. uh, FBI, to get warrants to go after Carter Page. Yes. Four, uh, four warrants, three months each, so a total of one year. Comey signed one of the war uh, one of the requests for a warrant. Rod Rosenstein signed another. A couple of other FBI officials signed the other two, uh, and they they asserted to that court, the FISA court, that th that this document was uh, a basis for probable cause to issue the warrants. So the courts issued the warrants. Many people believe they were hosed by Comey and by Rosenstein and by others. Then we find out that Lisa Page testified in secret testimony in the, before the Congress that, in fact, nine months of investigation of Donald Trump by the FBI before Mueller was named special counsel turned up nothing. There was no basis for anything, no problem, not, any, not only no probable cause, nothing. Right. So then Rosenstein appoints Mueller. Mm -hmm. Mueller allegedly finds out early on that there's nothing, but he stays yep. around for two years, mm -hmm. has a report, as you now know, uh, there's no legal standard of conspiracy or collusion with Russia. Matter of fact, even in the summary uh, issued in the four-page paper, <clears throat> the attorney general wrote that, uh, quoted Mueller, saying that not only wasn't there collusion, but what, there were efforts by the Russians to get in the inducement of, of Trump associates to collude. And they wouldn't do it. They rejected it proactively. So disgusting. So you tell me, after all of that, whether there was a coup uh, attempt, in, uh, like a banana republic in this country, by the uh, Justice Department, by the FBI. And then Loretta Lynch, by the way, meets with Bill Clinton on an airplane in Phoenix on the tarmac. And then she says it's a matter, not an investigation. He says that it has to be, uh, Comey says it has to be intent, when in fact gross negligence is all you need under the Espionage Act. What's going on? Uh, the truth be known, the least trustworthy the least just organization in America is the Justice Department. The Department of Justice, Justice is not trustworthy. And it doesn't matter if it's a, uh, of a coup where they're trying to control who's the president of the United States or if uh, somebody is being brought up for trial and the prosecutor is manufacturing, making up evidence against them. It is we have a serious, serious problem in this country, and it's from top to bottom in the Justice Department. And Americans ought to be alarmed. Uh, so this particular episode is very high profile, and it's extremely easy to do what you just did. Well, not really easy. It, you've got to be astute to do what you've just done, to put the pieces together and expose the Justice Department for being really uh, dishonest, inappropriate. It, it was a, uh, an attempted go. And I'm, I'm not a, uh, as I say, I'm not siding one side or another with, uh, uh, with in politics. I, I know too many people on both sides of the aisle and have no respect for them. But I will tell you that, that what you've just cited in the Justice Department is not the exception, it's the rule. You know, I'm going to share with you something you may know about. I interviewed a guy named Christopher Fuller on this program. Mm -hmm. um, he was a partner with a fellow who knew Evelyn Lincoln, uh, John Kennedy's secretary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew Evelyn Lincoln. I had dinner with her and her husband at one point. And um, she, it turned out that Bobby Kennedy had documents regarding the Kennedy assass his brother's assassination, the president. Mm -hmm. He turned them over to Evelyn Lincoln. He said that he wanted them to be secure, and he was confident they would be secure with her. Mm -hmm. She then left them in her will to this fellow who was like a son to her. Mm -hmm. And that fellow was partners with this guy, Christopher Fuller, who I interviewed. And he wrote a book about it. And the bottom line was, very simply, that uh, the CIA and other agencies didn't like the fact that Kennedy didn't want to go after Cuba, uh, didn't want to stay in Vietnam, didn't want to flex our muscles, which the agencies believed was the only way we could show our enemies 
that we meant business. And we he wanted they wanted him to stand up to Cuba, and um, and and deal with it far more than he did um, with the Bay of Pigs, for example. Yeah, and, Bay of Pigs was a disaster for him, and uh, it was. And yeah. so, and quite the, frankly, we lost the Cuban Missile Crisis. We, we we've written it in the West as if we prevailed, but we didn't. Uh, we that was quite the capitulation. Uh, Russia got exactly what they wanted. Well, to the point uh, that, and listen, I'm not, I don't know this, but, uh, and I'm not uh, endorsing it or not, but the point that Fuller made was that uh, it was the agencies that made sure John Kennedy was gone because he wouldn't play their game. Yes. And that's, that, uh, true or not, they they didn't like what he did, and that's the deep state that we're talking about today. It goes back to then. Brings you right back to the first point we started with on this program, which is that is, uh, is Julian Assange a, a hero or a traitor? And I say he's a hero because he has made the information available to us to make the same kind of informed conclusions that you just have. Uh, fair enough. And that, that, that is bringing it around to, to its uh, conclusion, uh, kind of you closing the circle. I think you might be really interested in uh, Maybe we'll do a, uh, if you're interested, a program on it later. You said you're, uh, you're Jewish. I, I'm not actually Jewish, but I, uh, I learned Hebrew so that I could translate the Dead Sea Scrolls out of uh, ancient Hebrew into English. And what I found there is, you talk about a cover-up, the English translations are horrid. I mean, they're, they're, in many cases, they're the antithesis of what the Hebrew actually says. We'll do that. Uh, I know that uh, your agent uh, sent me information about that, and we will do that. But let me ask you, yes. do you think that William Barr is going to either have a special counsel or employ a team to investigate officially in some way with subpoena power? To be able to go in and find out the truth and, and document what happened here, if there were, was there a predicate to the spying? In other words, was there a justification for it? Will we ever find that out? Will there be prosecutions of people at the Department of Justice or FBI for bad behavior? I do not think so, and I, I think it's because of the fact that if the American people were to be given that kind of a window into the malfeasance of the Department of Justice, it would be very difficult for them to maintain the level of of credibility that they require to function. So I don't think America will allow itself to become vulnerable in that way. We would not like what uh, what is discovered. And and I think you're right. I know you're right, uh, and, and, and intuitively. But the the issue is, does the country survive then? And what makes it any different uh, than a totalitarian dictatorship if we have a deep state controlling things behind the scenes, pretending that we have a democracy? What, what would and be the difference? Is, and that is the case. That is that is the case. And uh, no, the country doesn't survive. Um, we're too far gone in too many different ways to actually uh, survive. I think it's, it's essentially uh, extremely important that we understand what we have done that has gotten us into this fix. Uh, and we, and, and it's, there's a hundred things that we have done that, uh, including bankrupting ourselves uh, economically, destroying the value of our currency, um, and, including making it way too difficult for someone to start and prosper in a business uh, in America. We have done so many things that have been counterproductive, um, and dumbing down the uh, the average citizen such that that them voting is actually counterproductive. They don't know enough to vote. No, that's true. There are people who uh, who don't. And, you know, there, there are, look, there are people who will cheer to get rid of the Electoral College in the Midwest. Why would you do that when the Electoral College is the only hope small states have? No, that's actually true. The, the Electoral College you know, doesn't make any sense in, a, in, a, in the world that we're in today. Uh, but but it does have the advantage of it causes each state to um, to, to have merit because it's winner take all. It's, it, but it, it also has the other side of the equation. If, if for example, if a conservative is running uh, against a liberal in the state of California, um, th- there's going to be no campaigning there at all. So California right. becomes completely Democrat. isolated because there is no chance under any circumstance that a conservative is going to carry the state of California and it's winner take all. And oh, therefore, there is no campaign there. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today.